Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 17th Annual Harlem International Film Festival. I'm Marcos Luis, and we are so excited. This is the virtual edition of our film festival, and we just received good news that we're extended one more week. So you have until May 22nd to view the films on the film festival. I'm really excited today because this talk back is with director Dave Davidson of Cinema and Sanctuary, a beautiful documentary that you can find at event.org on the Harlem International Film Festival website for your viewing. Please make sure you check it out. Welcome to Harlem International Film Festival, Dave. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Thank you. Listen, I have questions. <laughs> First of all, what an incredible, incredible documentary. Oh, man. Thank you. That it was, I don't even know where to start with you. First of all, who, who is Dave Davidson? Uh, I've been a filmmaker for about 37 years, mostly uh, focusing on documentaries uh, in the areas of arts, arts and culture. A, a lot of um, actually African-American topics uh, in history and art. Um, and I've also just retired as a college professor after 35 years at the City College of New York. Wow, teaching I, documentaries. I, teaching documentaries, started a, a, a part of a group that started a graduate program there in 1997. And uh, despite the fact that, spoiler alert, the Film Institute that we're gonna talk about closed in the 60s, um, I was heir to kind of a renaissance of filmmaking uh, at City College after that. Yeah, so you're sort of in the bloodline of what the whole film is about. Yeah. This is, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. I love that. What, what do you want people to know about the documentary, first of all? <clears throat> well, I think all documentarians are, are junkies for untold stories. And when you discover something that literally seems to be a missing piece in the in the history of, of filmmaking, um, it's, it's really compelling and to be able to assemble the argument and the evidence to present that to a wider audience so that the, so that the narrative is a little bit more complete is, um, is really thrilling. And you know, we're ha happy to do that because there, you know, there's a lot of mythology out there about the roots of documentary itself, but also about the roots of film school. When you think about documentaries these days you know you can't pick up the remote and click on without coming across a documentary right. uh, Harlem Film Festival is no exception in in terms of just the flood of informed and sensitive documentary making going on out there but you know the question is what you know where did it come from and there's not one source but it's surprising that the uh, the first documentary school actually it didn't come out of a Hollywood based college, didn't come out of a high roller East Coast private college. It came out of a free public institution in the city of New York, actually located in Harlem. And that was the City College of New York. And the Institute of Film Techniques was born in uh, late 1940. That's amazing. Amazing. Now, I have to say, um, you know, I'm a filmmaker as well, and documentaries are my favorite to watch. I've worked on a team with documentarians, uh, a team from Venezuela, and we documented some things in Cuba. Documentaries are incredible. I think, like you said, the viewpoint that you have and the ability to gather the data and share, I think the learning, what, what you're teaching and what people are learning, you're giving people a view of something they, one, maybe never even thought about, and two, would like to explore further once you do tell the story. You bring up a really great point. Right? Because, you know, we talk about quote long form documentary, and once you get into an hour, an hour plus, you realize immediately that it's actually a pretty short form, and you're deciding what you can't tell, what you can't fit into the format. So all you can do is hope to inspire people to launch their own quest and learn more about the. You know, we so show so many different films in within the film that you can inspire something for people to dig deeper. Right. And I guess sort of a, a cheap equivalent to that would be like a spinoff of a documentary, <laughs> yeah, right. so to say, right? A series. <laughs> a series, yeah. How did, you, how did you begin with documentaries? I mean, has that always been your passion or did you start with something else? 
no, I think documentary has always been what I aspired to make, even just toying around in, um, in my undergraduate studies many, many years ago. Um, and that's actually where I discovered Hans Richter, who really is the central figure in, in the film. Uh, you know, when I was in college, there, there was a whole new kind of filmmaking going on, which is kind of a joke because Hans Richter had made his films in the 1920s, but in the 70s, we were just discovering underground cinema and new documentary and all these kinds of things. And I became a huge fan of Hans Richter. And you have to fast forward from that point to actually moving to New York, going to grad school, uh, starting to make my own documentaries. And I actually was hired at City College as an adjunct in the 80s. And somebody said, you know, Hans Richter used to teach here. Suddenly I was on sacred ground. So that just sent me on a quest to try and learn more about him. And I discovered the Institute. So this has been a, this has been a project that really was launched in the early 2000s. Of course, Richter oh, wow. was long gone by then. Mm -hmm. he, he passed in the mid seventies, but you know, I, by the time I got around to really thinking about it, uh, I realized that there had to be lots of graduates of the Film Institute out there. And to my surprise, even though it was centered on documentary, the range of people who came out of that, um, it goes on, you know, one end of the spectrum from Oscar winning uh, Hollywood type filmmakers through Oscar winning documentary makers, all the way to the other end of the spectrum where people like Jonas Meckes and uh, Shirley Clark attended. And they're really part of the new American cinema movement, which, mm -hmm. which was a foundational uh, uh, underground uh, film movement in the United States, which has really opened the door for independent filmmaking. So it was an eye opener. It really was. And watching it, it was incredible to see too, because this is all history that I didn't know obviously. And, and, you know, just in that short length of time, I feel like my brain is full. There's so <laughs> much information in there. How did you, how did you go about choosing your story? How did you go about choosing the people and the, the interviews that you had in the film? Well, there was very little research or documentation about the Institute, even on the ground at City College. And one thing that we were able to unearth was Ironically, when they renovated a building at City College in the closet, the workers found a box of rusty film cans. And this is like the detective story, you know, just, wow. you, you know, you have to make a film when you find that and start going through the material. And it was- How can you not? Yeah, you got to <laughs> <laughs> No stone left until- Right. So, so we started looking at the films and seeing this range of st actually student films you know when they closed the institute somebody shoved it in a closet um and at that point i started gathering names from credits and things like that and trying to track down people so originally it was to, to try and get an oral history it's like you don't re when there's that little data you mm -hmm. don't really know what the story is but you know there has to be one there because there's this void and uh in interviewing people year by year uh, getting pieces of the puzzle, putting them together, you realize this is incredible mosaic of, um, of people. Let's rewind a little bit to, to a snapshot of, the, of the, the student body at the City College of New York. I mean, these were working class kids who took the subway to the campus. I mean, it looked like a wonderful Gothic cathedral, you know, it looked like Yale or Harvard, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a public college. They went, they went there, they came from uh, humble beginnings. Their only um, brush with film was their parents probably kicking them out of the house on a Saturday afternoon to go to some Hollywood movie palace on the, uh, uh, the Grand Concourse in the Bronx and they were spoon fed Hollywood spectacles. And so here they come, the guy who's in charge is an aristocratic, um, uh, avant-garde artist who makes experimental films, they have nothing in common. So what happens when you put all of these people in the same box? There has to be some sort of magical alchemy that happens. And doing those oral histories with, with those people, there were incredible anecdotes of being exposed 
to a guy like Hans Richter and having him open the door to this completely different kind of filmmaking that they had no clue. They had no clue that it ever existed. I love that. And I love that for many reasons. I love that in not just the documentarian form, but in any form of filmmaking, because you're telling stories and you can be of any class, any stature. And if you have a story to tell, document it orally, you know, and make a film with it. So yes, bringing those two different to, uh, classes together, you're going to create some kind of magic. There's going to, magic is going to happen. They were, they were hungry, definitely right. were hungry to make films. I think probably the hardest thing about that, uh, those original generations of people who went to film school was going home to their parents' house, uh, parents who wanted them to be doctors and lawyers and explain, uh, well, there's th this thing called the Film Institute. <laughs> and of course, you know, I have story after story about parents being livid and not speaking to their kids, but um, they were brave and they, they, they went ahead and, and, and did it. And interestingly, you know, you talk about, you know, giving access to tools to, to, to underserved audiences. Uh, you know, back then, as opposed to a digital camera and SD cards where you have unlimited, literally unlimited amounts yes. of data to bring in through the lens, they were lucky to get 100 feet of 16 millimeter film and a little keywind camera. And you had to tell a story in that like minute and 17 seconds uh, when, as it was grinding through. So it did usher, I think, it, it ushered in a level of discipline in making choices before uh, you're sitting there in the editing room with hundreds of hours of footage and going, oh my God, what have I done? Um, that it, 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 it instilled in them a sense of, wow, this is precious. What's going, what's going into the, through this camera is precious. We have to think about what we're doing as opposed to kind of waving the camera around the neighborhood and thinking you're gonna come up with gold. Absolutely. Which makes the argument for why we still need film school. Yes, absolutely, absolutely right. And here's the other kicker is that we are now in a digital world where you can actually do it on your phone, you know, and, and I wanna, and we can sidestep with that too, like, because I think that what your film is, is an inspiration for many people in many genres and many, you know, social economic classes or whatever you wanna, what to call it. But we can now take our phones and start making documentaries if we need to, you know, which is great, which is mm -hmm. great. We had one film in the film festival who started her documentary with her phone. And you'd think, well, wow, this is accessible to everyone. If you have a story to tell, you can do it. You can do it. And, you know, witnessing history, it's just, it's a, it's a powerful tool because, you know, back in the day when uh, all kinds of filmmaking was incredibly expensive and out of, and out of reach, certain money elites were the people who were telling the story. Yes. Uh, there were exceptions to that rule, of course, yes. um, but now uh, everybody's empowered. And I think when everybody is empowered to kind of think past that, that initial wall of like, oh, I'm nobody, I don't have a story. There's nothing in my neighborhood to break through and utilize that tool uh, as an empowering device as uh, to tell your own stories has, has opened up just a floodgate of, of wonder. Also, we have to be careful because there are people who utilize these tools in you know, a manipulative way that yes. is counter to what documentaries should be doing in terms of enlightenment. And uh, we have to be careful of that. But right. um, ultimately, I think the democratization of media, as we say, will out and you know we're, the arc is going to go towards um, you know social justice and um, the right things and not the wrong things. Absolutely, and you touch a little bit on that. <clears throat> excuse me, in your film, the the beginnings of of documentaries, you know, and and that's what art is about, and that's how they used, you know, documentaries. Yeah, it's very interesting. In fact, you know, in in when the the Film Institute was conceived in the 1940s, there was some incredible, powerful documentary making go going on out there. And unfortunately, it was in the hands of the of the Nazi 
Nazi Germans. Yes. And Lenny Riefenstahl was doing films like Triumph of the Will, and people were uh, drawn into that. So the 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 um, crisis really that uh, was uh, that forged the beginnings of the Film Institute was really like, hey, we have a generation of young Americans who need to learn these skills to really push back against that warped message. And so that's how the Film Institute came into being. And Hans Richter himself was really a fugitive from the Nazis. He was labeled a degenerate artist, had to flee Europe with the SS on his trail. And literally, it's almost like he, he parachuted into Manhattan right into the Film Institute. I mean, I'm conflating it a little bit, but it was amazing how quickly he became uh, part of that uh, filmmaking team and not long thereafter became the director of the Institute. I love that. What do you say to the young filmmakers who are out there who want to, you know, maybe make a documentary and don't even know where to begin with it? Because this, your film was had such a history, such a rich history, and it's inspiring. And I'm sure it's going to inspire so many people to, to begin to make documentaries. Mm -hmm. How do we even begin? It's a great, it's a great question. But first of all, you have to be fearless mm -hmm. because the, the hardest thing is looking out there at just information. You know, story is something we create. Narrative is something that we create and you, and a documentary is a storytelling form. So you have to look for the elements that are going to make good story. And so often it's, it's what you have to leave out. And you know, that, that's not relevant, this isn't relevant. And sometimes uh, just you know, kind of what's left gives you a core of the beginnings of, of story, but also that you know, there's no absolutely unique and new story. We're here on a continuum of time. There's a backstory before your story begins your story points somewhere into the future. So I think to center yourself and feel that you're on that timeline, if you're doing something about your family, you know, there's a backstory. You've got elders to talk to. There might even be that magical shoebox of um, Super 8 films under somebody's bed, you know, photographs, family albums. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you really find characters, because that's the other thing is being able to find strong character to be able to, talk to them and be inspired by their words uh, to move on and take the pressure off yourself to try and reinvent the wheel. It's a, it's a process of dialogue. It's a process of research. And it's a process of patience. Stay with it and it'll come to you. That's it. And I think you, you made one key point that people may not understand is, yes, you're finding characters, but characters in the sense of, you know, what are they adding to the story to enrich the story, mm -hmm. you know? So I think a lot of people may think that, oh yes, this person is going to be in my documentary, this person, but it's actually someone who's going to enrich the value of the story for you. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And sometimes, you know, again, this is where patience comes in because sometimes you think you've got somebody and it just doesn't work out. Or many times you go, this is amazing, but it's another film. It's not this. <laughs> right. you know, so that's, a, but that's great. That's like money in the bank. You right. Know? <laughs> you can always come back to those stories, but it's, it is about hard choices. And in the end, it is kind of about eliminating things, not that they're bad ideas or that they're not interesting characters. You just can't fit them into the box. As I said before, even long form documentary suddenly seems incredibly short when, once you're under the microscope of actually trying to craft it into a story. Absolutely. Did you have any, I know we always go through challenges when we're making films. What, what were some of the challenges you had during this film, if any? Maybe you hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> <We don't know. laughs> yeah. No, a lot of, a lot of nails. A lot of different hammers, a lot of, uh, <laughs> maybe a screw. <laughs> yeah, you know, you never know. Um, you know, I, I think as I was talking a little bit about before, the hardest thing was knowing that there was story, but you're kind of in this vacuum. There's this void because it it's. I, I read books about the history of teaching film, and there was like a footnote. 
that said the Film Institute, when we gave chapters to other, to other institutions, there just wasn't anything there. So the hardest thing, which is also the most rewarding thing, was kind of looking out there at the universe and the stars and saying, I know that there are people who went to this school. And the beautiful thing is that once you find one person, for the most part, their memories are so vivid of how this institution changed the course of their lives. They know five people, and that person knows five people. And so it built in a very organic way. I mean, in the age of social media, it super like, you know, not steep curve, it didn't explode because um, a lot of these people were also of the age where many of them weren't even like on the internet really. You know, we did a lot of things by phone and had to invite a lot of people to New York. And we traveled around the country uh, finding people to do our interviews. But I would say at the beginning, just trying to get enough characters to piece together the story because we, for the most part, the faculty, Hans Richter himself, they, they passed on. So to be able to get the people's eye view of it, it really was a collage. You know, you had to get uh, a little bit here, an anecdote here, and gradually it built up. And I, I already knew the, the curve of Hans Richter's um, life. I knew where he was, when he was uh, doing it, what his own filmmaking, and um, that was pretty well set. And I'd done other work around Hans Richter as a character, but it was that missing piece of getting on the ground and trying to imbue the audience with what it was like to be in there, yeah, that box, yeah. you know? Yeah. And every, everybody came, came through. It was just amazing. It was, anything that didn't make it to the, into the film was, it was sorry to let it go on the, the cutting room floor. Beautiful. One last thing, mm -hmm. to invite people to see your film, what, what's a summary of the film? for us if you had to summarize it let us know well it's a mystery solved mm. and yes um as i touched on before documentary film touches all of our lives now we can't escape from it the more we know about it the more, more we know about that storytelling uh the better able we are to uh uh, absorb and analyze documentary filmmaking that, that's out there. So it was a real humbling experience to find kind of that cornerstone that goes in that building, which is now a skyscraper uh, that's documentary film. So I hope people will look at the film, be inspired by it, and take a look at some of those uh, clips from classic documentary films made by the people who were the faculty at the Film Institute. I mean, literally, it, it is talking history. Robert Flaherty, who made Nanooka the North. John Grierson, who invented the term documentary film. These are the people that Hans Richter surrounded himself with because he had such an international reputation. We have little clips of their films and they're inspiring. It'll take you back to a time when documentary film itself was experimental film. Well said. I, and I have to take a little sidestep too. Nanook of the North had flashbacks to 10th grade. I did. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I it just made me yeah. want to go back and watch it again to like really analyze it and, and absorb everything along with it. Look, yeah. I mean, if I look at it in the summer, I get chilly, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would also highly encourage people to look for Man with a Movie Camera by Giga Veritov. Okay. Uh, back in the experimental days, some even some of the early Eisenstein films. And of course, Richter knew Eisenstein. They were buddies. They worked together. So it really is a living history of filmmaking. And you realize how documentary has touched all genres, especially through this incredible man. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen watching, this is Dave Davidson, director of Cinema and Sanctuary, I invite you, I encourage you, I implore that you see this film. <laughs> you will be so happy you did. Thank you for joining us for the Harlem International Film Festival. And as I said, the film festival will be extended one more week, so you have a chance to. Please share this video and go see the film.
Once again, Cinnamon Sanctuary, Dave Davidson. How can we get in touch with you if we need to? Well, for for people who are uh, not around to stream it for this great extended week at, at Harlem, um, we do have a website and we are uh, uh, making DVDs available through the website. My not-for-profit uh, production group is called Hudson West, Hudson like the river, west like wild, and it's .org. And you can go right there and, um, in the spirit of, I think, the revival of, of vinyl and all that. If you want something you can hold in your hand, yes. it says Cinnamon Sanctuary on it, by way of a DVD, you can order one through us. HudsonWest.org. Make sure you go there and check it out. The film festival is HarlemFilmFestival.org, and we're showing these on Eventive.org. Please make sure you go there and stream this film. My name is Marcos Luis. You can follow me. You can find out what I do at marcosluis.com. Thank you guys for all joining us for this talk back. Dave Davidson, thank you very much. Thank you, Marcos. It was a great time. Once again, the film is Cinema and Sanctuary. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.